Hey, welcome back to Metchball Grid. My name is Andre. Thanks so much for tuning in. Just this morning, we have received the 2409 ban list, a ban list we are expecting and really excited for because this is the ban list that will be in effect for the upcoming 2024 World Championship. We're just five weeks away from going down to San Francisco for October 18th and 20th, and a lot of folks, myself included, we're really looking forward for this ban list because as soon as this is out, we have an understanding of what maybe the world's meta will look like and we can get to our grinding, we can get to our testing. Specifically, the ban lists before worlds are always pretty interesting because there's a bit of an expectation to make the world's meta as fun, as diverse, as interesting as possible, not only for players, but also for spectators. And that's what we have here with the 2409 ban list. And in this video, we're going to be going through this document. This is going to be up on Null Single Games website to talk about the changes and what we expect this to do to the meta. Now, I firstly want to give a huge thank you to the Null Single Games community team who have reached out to content creators to give them this sort of information before the Friday morning when this comes out so we can pre-record something like a video just like this. So what I'm working on right now is technically a Google document that contains the text that on Friday morning will be up on the Null Single Games website. There's a link to that below. Now, it might look slightly different up on that website. I've been told that the content should be the same. Maybe the phrasing will change slightly. Uh, but this article was written by Safer, who's the head of the standard ban list team with input from the rest of the team. And again, link to that will be in the description, but we're working off a Google document because that page is not just up yet. With that, we're going to be running through this article, talking about all the main points about it, what we're expecting, some history, what we think maybe worlds will look like. If you want to take a second to like the video, that definitely helps. But otherwise, we're going to jump right in. It's a pretty simple ban list. Only one line of text, and that is simply World Tree has been banned. Now, if you're not familiar for World Tree, this is a card that came out in Parhelion. So that's since the end of 2022. It's been with us for a while. And it is a very unique, a very powerful, a very flashy card. For some people, it could easily be their favorite card. World Tree costs six credits, has that mysterious deep net subtype, takes up two MU and four influence. It says the first time each turn you make a successful run, you may trash one of your other installed cards to search your stack for a card of the same type. Install the card you found, paying three credits fewer. So the idea is as long as you're making successful runs, you can trade your hardware for hardware, program for programs, resources for resources, and have that incredible click compression. The idea that you can get a card out of your deck and uniquely tutor a card you need for that board state or that matchup. And not only do you not have to draw it, but you don't have to spend a click installing it and you save three credits. That is an immense amount of click compression, an incredibly valuable card. Now, it can be clunky. It's 2MU. You need to get it early, and there can be some problems, but we've been seeing more and more decks that can get this down consistently and fire it just about every single turn. Interestingly, this is actually not the first time that Worldtree has shown up in the text of a standard ban list article. Uh, only like three months after this card came up, it was a bit of a target and ended up getting a Shaper Identity banned. This is Cabanessa Wu. She got banned out in the 2303 ban list just three months after uh, Worldtree was released. And while Cabanessa Wu's text is abstractly, generally, maybe a bit of a problem for program support going forward. Uh, her ability to get cards from her deck uh, and just tutor them out on the table with incredible consistency was a problem, not only for World Tree, but maybe in general, but also for World Tree. Text reads that you can spend a click to search your stack for a non-virus program, install it, saving a credit. But then at the end of your turn, if that program is still installed, you have to remove it from the game. So the idea with Cabanessa Wu decks is you could play a world treat, you could grab it from your deck, and as long as you had the sort of flicker-like ability, so a card that can uninstall and reinstall that same card for free, that second installation of the world tree was safe from that remove from game clause. And I think it was only a couple days after a Parhelion came out and we had world tree that we started to see lists like this. This is D's world tree Wu list. It was a massive 65 cards and it hinged around the world tree as much as it only had to play one copy of it. That means as soon as turn one, you can go and grab a self-modifying code from your deck using Cabanessa Wu's ability and use that self-modifying code to grab the World Tree. And as long as you have those upfront credits, you're set up to World Tree as soon as turn one. And with 63 other cards in your deck, it's not hard to get that near infinite feeling value of pushing yourself forward, saving yourself three credits and an install and a draw at a time. Uh, this thing was a beast. It was really consistent. Cabinet Wu's ability brought cards onto the table cheaply, so you always had fuel for that World Tree fire. It was definitely a meta of force. And it was only three months later, and notably this deck, I don't think actually won any big tournaments, but people understood it was a bit of a bear to play against because it was overwhelming. It was very powerful. It was seen as a tricky deck to play in person because there was a lot of shuffling, but even in tournaments of, uh, you know, you got 65 minutes to play two sides of a tournament, this could be a bit of a longer deck. But three months later in the 2303 ban list, it was noted Cabanessa Wu was going to get banned out. 
What I think is really fascinating is that article actually talks about some arguments why this deck could be considered to be a problem, and a lot of those problems still exist today. The article reads, Banning Wu weakens the World Tree deck in several crucial ways. Firstly, the deck's economy becomes far more finite as they are forced to play a smaller deck size. Wu allowed you to play grossly oversized piles of cards because she could easily grab any program you needed from your deck, including the eponymous World Tree. A smaller deck means that in the longer games, it could find itself running out of cards and getting taxed out. That's the sort of idea here. This is a 65 card deck that's inherently a bit of an engine with a single engine piece you need to get, but you do get it as consistently as you can imagine with Cabaness's ability. And so the idea is that there's a hope that World Tree one day might be a bit more of a fair card when it isn't played in a 65 card deck that can get it consistently. So you're not surrounded by all this fuel for the fire and the kind of downside of having to find your engine piece is a real downside because there wasn't a big downside when you're playing Cabaness Wu. So she got banned out. And largely, banning out Cabanessa Wu really slowed down people playing World Tree. Now, when the Tomina Initiative came out a couple months later, there was a fair bit of Shaper support, but World Tree did not jump really quickly back into the scene. I did a deck dive uh, kind of late into the Tomina Initiative meta playing a World Tree Arasana. We have a very similar idea of a deck. It's 60 cards, so much bigger than you'd expect, except now we're playing three copies of World Tree because we do have to kind of find it a bit more consistently. And once this was down, you could use Arasana's ability to tempo down programs a bit faster. We ran a lot of resources and this was just the same sort of world tree engine. Get your world tree down and you have all this like huge pile of deck that you can grind through value. You have some really interesting high influence flashy cards you can get consistently. This deck was really fun. It wasn't a massive tournament for us, but I think it was the sort of idea that, hey, world tree is maybe a bit more playable than it looked like. Now, this archetype, which wasn't really big at the Tomina Initiative, really got thrown into overdrive with the recent set Rebellion Without Rehearsal. And the article here is very clear about it. In RWR, shapers gained multiple cards that allowed them to find World Tree more consistently, like Muse, cheat around install costs like Trick Shot, and make their way through Ice like Entangler to get value out of World Tree. These are some really strong cards. And if you've played with Rebellion Without Rehearsal, you might notice that it is just one of the best Shaper sets we've seen of all time. And there's so many really strong Shaper cards here. Firstly, we have Muse. That is just one of the other card you can get in your deck to pull out the World Tree with consistency. Let alone also, it's very important for World Tree because it is a double install. When you install a Muse, you install another program, which means you have two programs to World Tree in two next turns, which is a lot of value for a single install. We also have Trick Shot. A card we'll be talking about more later, but it gives you four credits, maybe six credits to cheat down your world tree easier at instant speed with cards like Self-Modifying Code, very powerful card. And then Fazerum Entangler is a nice way to bypass non-barriers if you're trying to get those successful runs early. I think actually the biggest card from Rebellion Without Rehearsal that I'm surprised the article didn't mention is Coalescence. This is just such an important card for world tree. Not only is it a program that is tempo positive, on the turn that you get your world tree down, this is often your first target. The idea is that if you get your coalescence for free with the world tree, you just clicked for four credits, not even clicked. It was clickless. And then every coalescence can become the next coalescence, which is four credits. It works with Muse. This is, I think, one of the bigger reasons why world tree is good. It needed this battery. Uh, we played before we had something like this, but there's just like four strong cards that made world tree really, really good and really, really good. It was uh, shout out. This is do not put your deck down. This is Jai's published list that the tiebreakers are playing all across the continental season. And we're exactly back to the sort of issues that were highlighted in the 2303 ban list. When we have a deck that is bigger than what we'd expect, it can get the world tree down relatively consistently. And then on top of it, you have this massive shell of 60 other cards, which means the world tree doesn't feel like it gets taxed out. You have nearly infinite feeling value to push yourself forward and make these aggressive world tree trades. Now, notably, this deck, too, it's only on 10 influence. This deck is actually bigger than 63 cards because while the influence printed on this deck list seems to be relatively fixed across players in the tiebreakers, this deck list goes through from player to player in the tiebreakers and there's explanations of how they spent their last influence. And I think this is actually one of the bigger problems potentially with the sort of world tree shell is that you have this massive deck that is very value based. It's hard to deal with it, and it has the ability to pack all these additional tech cards. So some players are having access to Clot when they think Fast Advance is a thing. Some players are being a bit more aggressive and playing Banhar, which is pretty fun in Shaper. And then I think one of my favorite splashes is Light the Fire showing up as a way to deal with Managarm Anoetic remote servers. So we end up in this wild situation where we have a deck that both can consistently get its engine piece down, has a near infinite amount of fuel, and then can, with little to no cost to the consistency of the deck itself, play all these tech cards 
To me, the sort of orthogonal strategies of corporations are attacking at different angles. The runner deck is prepared and it's hard to tell what they can do because they have so many options. It's just the biggest toolbox, which you can easily as a shaper, dig your hand in and pull out the right thing for the right time at very little cost to the inconsistency of adding more cards to your deck. It's kind of having your cake and eating it too. It's the problems from 2303, but now this deck list has even more tech cards in it because we got slots. We're playing air blades because it's a good enough hardware. Good luck making damage matter. It's a it's pretty flexible deck. And the ban list article talks about this very directly, right? The true strength of the deck that it can consistently get its powerful engine running with a large deck size, no longer constrained by slots. World Tree Ari can play one-off tech cards to easily adapt to any problematic matchup. With these World Tree lists being able to easily adapt to a variety of corporation threats, it's hard for corpse to account for all of the silver bullets a World Tree list can present. And that's what this deck felt like. If you ask me and you ask a lot of players about two months ago, what's the best deck in the meta? A lot of people would just say World Tree because it's a deck that's consistent. It has a deck that has a really strong run based economy and it has the ability to add all these cards that make all these other matchups. I wouldn't say trivial, but a lot easier at very little cost. Generally, you're making these decisions before an event. What do you think you need to put in your 45 card runner deck? What is the meta you're predicting? And World Tree just says, hold my beer. I'm putting it all in. I don't care. But what's even more fascinating is this next article. Going back to our guiding principles in this update, we believe the meta is in a healthy place. The one X factor in our meta analysis is World Tree Ari. While its initial presence in online tournaments hinted towards meta dominance, we have not seen this pan out yet. We do not know why many players have decided to put down their deck. And this is really, really true. Again, a lot of people think this is the best deck right now in the format, but not a lot of people are playing it. It has quieted down. There's some really big success over the continental season, but currently if you're looking at World Tree decks and World Tree RE decks, it's not super prevalent. Now, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Again, we're just searching for World Tree on Netrunner DB to look at some of the recent deck lists. And while there's some really cool non RE big deck World Tree things, uh, there's just not a lot of World Tree RE doing tournament stuff right now. Now, if you're looking at Shaper decks right now and having tournament success, I think you're actually looking at LAT. And there's a couple LAT decks, but LAT is showing up everywhere and more consistently getting those tournament wins and those tournament points. It's not exactly World Tree Arasana everywhere, as much as people admit that World Tree Arasana is probably the best deck in the format. There's a couple of reasons for that. Again, it's a tricky deck to play. A lot of the continental season that this deck was doing really well was an online tournament. And online tournaments playing on Jinteki.net are a fair bit easier for this deck to play out. World Tree inherently forces you to shuffle your deck a lot. And if you're playing a 40 minute in-person round, mind you, JNet shuffles pretty quickly. But if you want to shuffle on the table, you can easily spend maybe five minutes of a 40 minute round uh, shuffling your deck, which can be frustrating for maybe both you and your opponent. But there are still a bunch of people who are bringing this deck to in-person play and not going to time and doing really well, but it's, we just don't see a lot of it. I think to some extent people expected this to be a target of the upcoming ban list for Worlds, so they've decided to not like sunk cost study the deck and put more time grinding into it. So there's a chance that this prophecy is self-fulfilling to some extent, but it is a deck that very notably we honestly don't see a lot of. But that being said, for the biggest event of the year, we expect players to pick this archetype back up since it is so versatile. To avoid a potential situation where World Tree Ari presents itself as a deck with answers to anything, Corb decks could throw at them in an otherwise healthy meta. We decided to ban World Tree itself so no other archetypes would be impacted. So the short of the long is, we think that this is one of the best decks in the format. It has a really wide spread against corporations where it can be relatively suffocating once it goes up. And we expect for a tournament like Worlds, where if this was the best deck that people would put in the legwork to learn the deck, really figure it out and be an absolute shaper monster on the table, having their tech cards and their consistency and just running down everything. That's the entirety of the ban list. So if you're preparing for the world championship and you're getting ready, you have five weeks. I think all you have to understand is there's not going to be any world tree there, which for a lot of people had no impact on their testing. I think there's a lot of people that would consider world tree, but there's a lot of people who just don't want to play a deck that complicated over a potential two day event. So they won't. Now I think overall going into worlds, I think we have a pretty open meta. I imagine the corporation meta got wider and the runner meta is honestly probably the same as it is right now, which is relatively wide. I think every faction has at least two decks that you could consider bringing to worlds, which is pretty exciting. And if World Tree truly was the best deck with the widest matchup spread that people had to put the time in to learn and spend 10 minutes of a 40 minute round shuffling, at least we're going to avoid that. But it's a strange situation because it's the best deck, but we don't see it. But a lot of people do think it is the best deck. 
Now, there's a lot more to this article, and a lot of this stuff is very interesting. Mind you, the SBL doesn't just come up with ideas and say they're true. They test them. They have a bunch of SBL testers that are trying things out to make sure that they can make a meta that feels healthy and diverse, and a lot of time goes into that. Shout out to the SBL testers and the SBL team. So here's some other considerations of things that the SBL is keeping in mind and is trying and why they thought these would not be better options going into the 2024 World Championship. Firstly, they want to talk about the Shaper meta prevalence. And I think right now, the probably the most consistent and well-represented faction across all standard really is Shaper. Shaper just got away with so many really, really good cards from a Rebellion out with rehearsal. I think it's mostly Shaper cards in that pack. Uh, and Shaper's just doing really good. And there's multiple Shaper archetypes. I think World Tree is just one of them. Uh, m- mostly our Asana World Tree, but still Kit is doing great. Lad is doing great. And we've even seen some more niche archetypes like Akiko do well in tournaments, which is pretty exciting. And some of the options maybe to bring Shaper down a peg because Shaper is maybe overperforming as much as it has been pretty fun. One of the big targets to talk about was Trickshot. I think Trickshot is one of the new cards and a lot of people think this, this is a pretty busted powerful card myself included. Trickshot came screaming out of the gates with a rebellion at rehearsal, giving so much money, so much multi-access, so much click compression, touching two servers in one run. It just kind of does everything, and it feels a bit hard for corporations to interact with this thing. This card's also an important card, as mentioned in a lot of these World Tree lists, because you can use the credits on the Trickshot to spend your self-modifying code to get your World Tree down cheaper. It does a lot, and it is a card that's consistently seen as a three of in every single shape or archetype we see today, which is notable, because that's not true across a lot of the cards we're going to be talking about today. Now, the SPT team said specifically that Trickshot encourages proactive strategies rather than sitting back and setting up. We're happy to see this shaping, pun intended, the faction's game plans and slot choices. While Trickshot ban would hit all of the archetypes, it might shift Shaper's playstyle and change the meta more than we were looking to do for Worlds. With all that said, we'll be keeping a close eye on Trickshot moving forward. There's an understanding that this card is very, very powerful, maybe a bit too powerful, but currently it's a bit exciting and it gives shapers a lot of reasons to run and interact. And it is a defining faction, defining card, which is nice that we have those. Now, I think this first point about how Trickshot encourages proactive strategies to be something that's really quite commendable. Uh, I sometimes get nervous when Shaper is the good faction in uh, most uh, uh, competitive environments because when Shaper is good, especially back in the day, we often ended up in these like sort of control strategies. Where a lot of Shaper decks, and mind you, this is like six to seven years ago, would just sit back and set up. And then whenever something ends up in a remote server, they'd be able to cheaply run it. And they don't have a lot of reason to be aggressive. They just basically say, okay, you're stuck in here with me. I'm not going to have to win. You're going to have to win. And I'm just going to stop you from winning, and then I will win. And so it's a lot different right now, which is great. Because I never liked those sort of control strategies where the Shaper just sat up and played Siege. So it is nice. It is much nicer that we have aggressive reasons to run and interact. And overall, I think that's a good look. It's pretty exciting. It's a bit of a change for Shaper that we've been seeing over the last two or three years. And overall, I'm kind of a fan for it. Now, I do think Trickshot is a bit good. And the SBL team obviously is aware of that, but not for this world. I think Trickshot's going to have a really fun world this world. The second target is self-modifying code, often referred to as SMC. The article says with the release of Muse, shapers were given more options and redundancy for their tutor effects. Tutor, mind you, being the term for getting cards out of your deck with consistency. SMC was an appealing candidate for reducing the power of Trickshot while killing the big deck world tree lists. However, we've seen some shaper archetypes pop up that are not even using SMC. SMC is such an iconic card that we want a strong justification for banning it, and we didn't feel like the circumstances meet that threshold. SMC is a very powerful card. It has been a candidate and discussion for ban lists for a long time now. And notably, this card's also been around for a long time. This card is over 10 years old. It's original printing and creation and control. Uh, Again, in 2013, it's been a thing. The Shaper Faction has largely been designed around the existence of SMC for better or for worse. And this card is one of the best things to use with Trickshot because it, it means that you're always able to use those four to six credits you get for that run. And you can get your breakers at instant speed, let alone your world tree. It's true that there actually is a bunch of archetypes right now that are not playing self-modifying code. It's honestly about half of the shapers, it feels like, which is quite interesting. But it is a way to target shaper. But as they say, it is such an iconic card that you probably need a bit of a better reason for that. I do think we have seen World Tree lists that are not even playing self-modifying code. They're getting away with just playing Muse and maybe playing 45 cards. That might help with some of the arguments that World Tree can have its cake and eat it too. Big deck size, a lot of tech cards, but have no inconsistency issues. Uh, So maybe that was an angle, but it turned out in testing for that not to be the thing. 
Now, those are the targets that the SBL discusses about Shaper. There is one more card we'll talk about at the end of the video, but those are the two things to be looked at. And right now, I think Trickshot is still potentially a concern, but it's going to have a fun world. But SMC seems like it's still going to be getting programs out of your deck at instant speed for time to come. Now, the next topic is an unban, and the only unban that seems to be considered was Gold Farmer. Unbans are really exciting because there's obviously a bunch of cards on the ban list and every once in a while they come off the ban list, which is basically like getting a brand new card for a lot of players. And that can be a lot of fun. We've seen some really successful unbans in the last couple ban lists. Lamb coming off, which is a pretty big success for Worlds last year. And the one consideration this year was Gold Farmer. And ultimately it was deemed not worth coming off the ban list. For the uninitiated, Gold Farmer was an NBN barrier. Cost only three to res, one strength. Uh, this came out on the Ashes cycle. and. I don't like this card at all. I really don't. It's a bit of a stat stick. Uh, anytime that you break a subroutine on this, you have to lose a credit, which means at minimum, you're spending three credits to get through this. At an average, you're paying about four credits to get through a gold farmer, which means this card is not very interesting. Like, oh, I paid three. You pay four every time I go through it. I'm winning, says the corporation. Now, you can go through this by paying six credits if you have no breaker, which is on the cusp of being interesting. But inherently, that's just way too much money to consider it. And Gold Farmer was banned many years ago, back in 2020, if I'm not mistaken. The ban list in 2020 shouts out Gold Farmer. It was banned because in combination with GameNet, it disincentivized running. Uh, runners find it frustrating to go through this thing. It has such a big credit swing. The numbers on the card are just a bit good. And GameNet, an identity that's still standard legal, as much as I wish people forgot it existed, means that it was an even worse financial swing, where you pay for the corporation gained two. That is just way too much for a three credit ice. We also found out through playing more Gold Farmer, it was not only good in NBN, but people realized this was a taxing barrier. We could just put this in any faction and it worked pretty good. This again is of uh, 2020. We're playing, what is it, nine influence for three copies of Gold Farmer? Because it's just one of the best barriers for taxing versus res costs that you could put in any deck. And this is the same conclusion that the SBL came down to. They realized that NBN might have needed a boost in this ban list. Uh, NBN recently lost Bologna, the 5-3 agenda that did seem to bring the whole faction down a peg. And while we're still seeing some NBN decks be successful in the meta, it's definitely a bit of an underdog. Uh, but the idea of scoring NBN that actually wants to put agendas behind ice and play that sort of game doesn't really exist. And Gold Farmer right now might be a way to encourage that to happen. What they found out in testing is that while it does help scoring NBN. The fact that this will just end up in Ag Infusion as a value piece was honestly better for those decks than it was for NBN. And I think my favorite sentence on this whole thing is his last sentence. In summary, Gold Farmer remains banned because in testing, runners found games with Gold Farmer less fun. It's not a particularly fun card. It can be a good card for the corporations, but it is just numbers on an ice. I'm not a big fan of it. I'm glad it's not back. Now, our last point when it comes to considerations is the HB meta prevalence. This article says various archetypes around precision design, Acer Group, and sports metal, all HB identities, have consistently had a significant presence at high level tournaments over the last months. We do feel that this indicates a consistent framework of HB decks with a few slots to slightly adapt for the expected runner metagame. At a large, high stakes tournament such as the World Championship, this might lead a number of players to return to HB after experimenting with other powerful but high variance decks. There's this idea of comfort decks. If you're going to a meta and you don't know what it is, you can't call it. It's a bit of a mystery. You have these comfort decks that you fall back on, these panic decks. And HB right now is just the easiest panic deck. I think it's a safe bet. If people don't know what they want to bring to the World Championship, one of the best things you can bring for a long, maybe two-day event, just play PD. It's relatively easy to play. It's consistent. It's efficient. It has great, just it does good stuff at a good rate. It is often a lot of people's comfort pick. And a lot of these identities right now have really strong archetypes that are working well and have been working well classically for a while. And I think understanding that there's going to be a lot of HB at Worlds, it's probably a given. Talking about these archetypes too, PD, there's classic PD, just like in System Gateway with your Anoetic Mana Garms. But recently, the sort of Shoot the Moon YDL decks are my favorite Corp deck to play right now. They're really, really powerful. Of course, we have Asa Group. I think Asa Group is a lot of fun too. Jai had a killer run across this whole uh, summer playing this Asa Group deck with Holloman. It's fantastic. We're even seeing some really strong sports metal decks. It's another comfort pick. Whether it's play the same deck from 2018 or whether it's something wilder like this, this is the sort of like moon pool core damage deck that's been doing great. Uh, there's a lot of good options and I think HB is going to be the comfort pick for many. If you look at recent tournament results, and this should be not surprising on the Shaper side too, this is an NPC Montreal, a tournament we ran a couple weeks ago. If you look at the distributions, the green is Shaper, the purple is HB. Just at a lot of tournaments, this is what people are bringing because it's the most consistent and most comfortable. Same thing, this is German Nationals a couple weeks ago. 
it's not that much different. And I think understanding going into worlds that there's going to be a lot of comfort HB, there might be some reason for the ban list to maybe address that and bring HB down a peg or so. Now, the SBL tried two things to really address the power and the consistency of HB, and ultimately their testing didn't seem to produce the results they wanted to. The first target was Gatekeeper, which is really fascinating. It's not a target I would have thought of, but it's definitely a very powerful card. I'm actually uh, liking this card even more with the sort of your digital life decks that don't want to shuffle back agendas and just want to have a big hand size. But honestly, one of the most interesting ice in the entire format. It's six strength on the turn it's rezzed, and for the rest of the game, it's zero strength. So there's a big reason to be aggressive and get this rezzed as soon as possible on turns where it's not the biggest problem for you because you do not want this to be six strength on the turn where it really matters and you have to run the remote server. Now, these subroutines are good. They're utility. They give you some like way to deal with agenda flood or just have a lot of cards in hand. And overall, what the SBL found out by testing, by removing Gatekeeper, that it just kind of hit HB a bit too much. Right now, HB's ice giving them tempo and giving them utility is kind of what HB is about. And having these like mid range to cheap ice pushing them forward seems to be a lot of their game plan. And removing it seemed to be just too heavy of a hit uh, to bring HB down to a way that they probably struggle against a lot of stuff. On the other side, Luminal Transubstantiation was the other target. And this is a very fascinating card. It's a one of, so it doesn't show up in every game. But in the games where this gets scored out, it has a huge impact on the game. The limit one per deck system gateway agendas are very powerful. This might be the most powerful and you might be in the situation where the corporation scores this out, has a whole turn extra and stall advances the Ikua and they're going from two points to winning the game on their next turn. That is an incredible uh, turn of tempo if you're not expecting it. Now, of course, there's a lot to be said about these high variance, high impact one of cards per deck. Some people have stronger opinions on that than others, but overall, the SBL has said that while it would act as a debuff to every single HB deck out there, specifically the scoring HB decks, it would take away one of the biggest threats that an installed card in HB can represent. So they decided against that ban. So that means we're still going to have Luminal for Worlds. I'm pretty sure in a lot of the games where the corporation scores at a Luminal, their win rate just goes up 10 to 25% unscientific but it is a heck of an agenda but that means if you're looking for a comfort deck to take the worlds hb is not touched at all uh losing world tree is probably pretty good for you but if you want to play that comfort hb deck that you've been playing for the last four years you can still do it and that's honestly fine i'm a pretty big pd asa group fan and i like some sports metal as well Interestingly, there's some other honorable mentions and these are very fascinating cards that were looked at and considered with sbl banning uh, firstly is your digital life. This is a new card, an efficient tool for bouncing back from low credit totals. Uh, this card I've enjoyed a lot. Uh, it's actually been a backbone economy piece to a lot of interesting decks, whether it's PD with extra hand size and a lot of card draw, whether it's bacterial programming, drawing you seven and getting into a punitive counter strike. There's a lot of flexible decks where this showed up that you wouldn't have expected. And it's been a fun card to play. The SBL did an AMA and ask me anything on Green Level Clearance Discord channel a couple weeks ago. Now, huge shout out to Penachair that combined all those answers into a Word document that's shareable. I should be able to attach that to the comments below. Now, one of the comments that came up was asking the SBL team about certain problems they see in the meta or certain cards and issues that they would like to address, but can't necessarily garner a ban. And cards like YDL, Your Digital Life, came up a lot. And that's because the SBL has been noticing, same with design and dev and no Signal Games, is that there have been more and more corporation cards that allow them to bounce up from low credits to big credits in a way that can be a bit difficult for runners to interact with. Classically, as a runner, if I ran down a corporation and forced them to res all their ice, I might buy myself an entire turn where the corporation can't do much besides click for credits. But over the last couple of sets, we've ended up with a lot of cards that make that window a bit less uh, uh, guaranteed. It's very easy for a corporation to do credit credit YDL. Now, that's probably not the best here digital life if they don't have that many cards in hand. But these sort of cards have an impact on the game because they are always these like safe recovery options. Uh, and we've been seeing more of them than expected. The SBL is very aware that this card might be a problem. It's an incredibly aggressive card and it's hard for runners to interact with it. So it's definitely on the radar of something that might be addressed later. They say we think YDL will need to be addressed at some point before it rotates but it currently enables so many corp archetypes that it would too heavily impact the meta. So I'm imagining it's a card that will end up on a ban list in the future, but it is definitely going to be playable at this world. Now, the final card that's addressed by name is Punitive Counter-Strike. I've actually heard this as a kind of a request to end up on a ban list. And this is a card that has been performing relatively well over this last summer in the Continental season. This is a card that does meat damage if the runner stolen agendas, big agendas generally. A lot of corp decks are feeding three pointers or six pointers and then ending with one or two Punitive Counter-Strikes to get a flat line for the runner. 
This is also a card that has been around for a really long time. Originally printed in true colors, again, more than a decade ago, this is something that has always been a threat, and in certain metas, it's bigger threat than in other metas. Right now, it's eating pretty well. Now, the article mentions that right now in the standard meta, while punitive has been doing good, it's fallen off a bit in the last couple of months. I think one of the most important parts is that there are more cards that are playable now than ever that the runner can use to counteract and to fight against that punitive threat. Whether it's Steel Skin Scarring, Class X, Stone Ship Chart Room, there are more ways now to deal with punitive than we've ever had before. Now, that doesn't mean that this card can't be oppressive. I think the runner can just make one simple mistake in Dirty Laundry Archives and die on turn two. That can be a problem for sure. You have to watch out for that. But it is a card that's finding itself in multiple archetypes. It's keeping some Jinteki decks alive. It's a sort of a thing in Wayland. You don't see it that often, which is weird. It's definitely another win condition that I'm expecting you're going to have to watch out for worlds. And if you can get an additional tech card into your deck to deal with it, it might be worth your time for sure. Now, finally, this article ends with an overall notes on meta game diversity. And this is actually such an important paragraph. I think we're just going to straight read through this thing. It says, overall, we are happy with the diversity that we've seen in the game as most corp factions have multiple viable and varied archetypes available to them. Yet, this is the result of some very powerful runner decks, both out of Anarch and Shaper. Now, firstly, just to address that sentence, Anarch and Shaper. It's mostly Shaper that's been discussed in this article, and then Anarch is, is doing relatively well. Criminal right now in the meta seems to be the least represented by a large margin, and some folks might have expected Criminal to get some love from this ban list, as difficult as that might be to do. I do think overall Criminal is a pretty reasonable choice going into the World Championship, and while that deck might seem less flashy because most Criminal decks didn't receive any new cards from the last set functionally, I do think Criminal should not be discounted. There's some really good reasons to play Criminal, especially if you're expecting there to be a lot of HB at Worlds. But overall, Anarch and Shaper seem to be the top of the meta, uh, I would say pretty comfortably by most people. Now to continue, it says, there is not a single deck to point at, but rather multiple ways of presenting a lot of value and efficiency, which forces Corpse to go for more extreme strategies, such as re-education as Mari or horizontal two-way lists to spread the runner's options thin. This is a really big point. Uh, firstly, we're talking about re-education as Mari for the first time in this article. That might have been a deck that people were expecting to be addressed, whether it's a punitive counter-strike ban or I don't know what we're doing, getting rid of re-education. This is a very mean list, and I think this is actually a list that shows you a lot about what the meta looked like over the summer. I think right now, runners are probably having a higher win rate on average than corporations. But what we were seeing over the summer is where we were seeing these orthogonal corporation strategies. The idea is that on average, if you put a runner and a corp in the same room, the runner will overtake the corporation in a lot of ways. And so it was on corporation deck builders to bring a deck to the next big event that can attack the runner in a way that the runner is not expecting and not prepared for and get some of these potentially surprising wins. This deck is a very good candidate for that sort of play style. If you don't run the remote server that has a Jupstad grid and a re-education in it with a Holloman, you can never advance a lethal flatline that is pretty safe into most tech. And if the runner is too aggressive and not expecting, oh, you just hit a three-pointer, you're going to die to double punitive counter-strike from an Asmari deck that has a lot of money. And this is a sort of thing that we saw constantly through the summer. Runners are good, corporations attack with a strange orthogonal strategy, and it wins them some games. The next week, runners now are expecting that orthogonal strategy. They're a bit more prepared for it, let alone the game plan they understand, and they might have some better cards in their deck. And that corporation deck just shows up less often and converts less well. That means the corporation now moves to a second game plan that is another different orthogonal strategy to attack the runner decks that they're expecting. And we end up in this meta that actually evolves pretty quickly from week to week, where we see certain decks that are incredibly prevalent, incredibly strong that fall off because runners are now kind of prepared for it. And we end up in this cat and mouse. And I think this summer we had a lot of these orthogonal strategies come in and come out. I think that's a common thing we've been seeing across this whole summer. And it's a really weird thing to address. Because if you're looking at just win rates between runners and corporations, that number seems relatively fair. But if you ask me, I think runners are probably in the driving seat right now, and it's up to the corporations to react to the runners to get that win rate up to parity. What does that mean for Worlds? I honestly don't know. I think there's going to be a lot of corporations with some interesting orthogonal game plans that maybe without World Tree, they're going to be more comfortable to bring to Worlds. It's up to runners to figure out how to get a deck that can win against those orthogonal game plans and still have a good matchup against that sort of expected precision design field. The article finishes saying this, on the other hand, leads to a bigger divide in power levels between the strongest decks and the other options. 
The overall high power level makes it hard for less conventional options to be viable, as the runner decks are already teched out to withstand a wide variety of threats and corps are deploying highly specialized strategies. We are aware of the state of the metagame, but we do not see a way of evening out the playing field through bans alone. Rather, we see this as an opportunity for future sets to adjust and reshape the game. Couple things there. Firstly, is there a bigger divide in power level between the strongest decks and less viable options? I think there is. I felt a bit of a squeeze over the last couple of months trying to get tier three and tier two things work against some of the faster decks in the meta, for example. I feel like there might be a bit of a difference. And I think some of that might be how sharp the orthogonal strategies feel like they are. That if you don't see it coming and you don't have a way to inherently interact with their strategy, you can just get bulldozed over. And that's something that obviously the SBL, but more importantly, design and dev have to keep in mind. Now, this last sentence is also very important to understand. Rather, we see this as an opportunity for future sets to adjust and reshape the game. The standard ban list team is responsible for a lot. Of course, we're looking for a healthy and exciting meta for the world championship, let alone JNet casual or whatever uh, GNK or circuit opener you're going through over the next couple months. But very importantly, SBL is now really well integrated from my understanding with design and dev and null signal games. So if there's certain issues that are arising in uh, play patterns and deck strategies that the SBL sees and they can't just fix them immediately with a big ban list change, there's a sort of information that's being fed to design and dev. So future sets cannot replicate those same potential mistakes and pitfalls, but more importantly, address those in a more holistic way so that the card pool in a way kind of heals some of the problems we're experiencing right now. And I have no doubt that's happening behind the scenes right now at NSG. It's a big year next year at Dawn, which is pretty exciting, but just keep that in mind. Some things can't just be immediately fixed by bans and understanding what's a difficulty out there for all sorts of players is going to be brought to design and dev on a holistic level, which is pretty cool. And that wraps up the article. Uh, honestly, just one line, World Tree is banned might be enough for some, but I like talking about this and I have a lot of respect for the folks at the SBL for all the testing they put into this and then taking their ideas and their thought processes and their learnings and making it public so we understand what their priorities are and what they've learned and what the future would look like. I do want to take a second to address one card that didn't show up on this. And when I ask uh, viewers of the Match Paul Grid, like what they expect and what they hope for on a ban list, a card that showed up a lot in that feedback, which didn't show up at all in this article, is Turbine. And I kind of understand it. This is Turbine. I don't like Turbine. I think a lot of people don't like Turbine. And this was an absolute nightmare, if you ask me, about four to five months ago at this time, where once Turbine came down for four credits, all breakers went up plus two strength. And then as a corporation that's trying to score behind ice, when you res a Vampiranasa for seven and they break it for two with a buzzsaw, it feels really quite bad. And you end up in a spot where you feel like you just want to give up and ice doesn't matter. And I think that's a true problem as much as I think the bigger thing is we're not really seeing that right now for many interesting reasons, whether it's the orthogonality of all the other decks you have to worry about getting your turbine down and breaking ice efficiently isn't the main strategy of a lot of the decks we're seeing in the current competitive standard field. A lot of Shaper decks right now are not even playing Turbine. They have other ways to attack the meta with other efficient breaker suites that are a bit more aggressive and come down a bit faster potentially. Here I search for Turbine in uh, the recent decks on Netrunner DB, and you don't actually see that much presence of Turbine across tournament placing decks. Somewhat frustratingly enough, I don't think Turbine seems to be a problem right now. Its threat of existence is important, and whether people are actually going to cash that check and put Turbine into their deck, or whether someone's going to play Glacier Architects of Tomorrow and have a great time at World Championship, that's going to be told in five weeks. We're not sure right now, but otherwise, this is not mentioned in the article. And if you ask me, I don't think Turbine is up on the top of people's lists of things to be exactly testing when it comes to the World Championship. Now, of course, Maybe it's there, maybe it's not there. It's up to corporations to make that call. But currently, Turbine seems to be okay, which is a strange sentence for someone who doesn't enjoy Turbine. But all in all, that's the list. 2409, just five weeks to the World Championship, just one card banned out. Again, huge shout out for the SBL team, all the testing they do to get this together and writing up the article and sharing this. Thank you, community team, as well. I'm excited to hear what you think about this list. Now, I think we're likely to have a pretty wide meta going into the World Championship. I don't think anything is clearly on the top. I think Lat looks really good right now, but there's some good reasons to play just about everything. We have five weeks to figure out what that really feels like and see what sort of orthogonal strategies are going to be sneaking up on us at the last minute. Now, finally, before we throw it to the Patreon outro, I'm just going to roll a little clip that we've been sitting on for about a year and a half. But otherwise, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoy your testing for the World Championship and we'll hopefully see you there. Ciao. This is World Tree. Um, man, what a card. This is the card I'm most excited in all of this entire set.
It is just absolutely nonsense powerful for so many reasons. It's yeah. just an incredibly fun card. Everyone enjoys playing with it and everyone agrees it is just too busted to survive. Good. Like, that might just be what this card does. It is got this like incredibly high ceiling of how creative can you be in deck building. To some extent, how many cards can you fit in your deck? Uh, yes, I have full confidence that at some point this is going to get banned because it is just nonsense. It is way yeah. too good and way too fun. Yeah, it's, it's you know, like, I'm glad this card exists. I feel like this could cost 10 and still be on the margins Reasonable. of playable. Yeah, yeah. 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 Phenomenal. I, top of man being, right? Like, this is going to get banned. There's yeah. no way it's not. No, the, I, this card is definitely getting banned. I don't know how, how we slept on this as playtesters, but we'll see. We'll see. So good. Hey, thanks so much for watching. A new ban list. <laughs> One sentence is all it takes. And I think... Honestly, for a lot of people, this ban list is going to change very little. I think it's nice to understand as a corporation, there's no world tree. But if you are not one of those world tree gamers who is confident in their ability to shovel the deck as many times as they can in 40 minutes, uh, this doesn't change that much, which a lot of people are just waiting to understand what the ban list looks like so they can get to their testing and let your testing begin. You want to make some big predictions of what's going to win the world championship? We still have five weeks to lock something in, but I'd love to hear what you think about this. I want to give a huge thank you to all these names and more. Uh, these are just some of the folks that help support the Metchball Grid. We also have our daily cast patrons. Their support is incredibly appreciated. A lot of time goes into this channel, whether it's recording, editing, streaming. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. We're working through all the name PC footage that should be coming up just as soon as Monday by the time this comes out, which is really exciting. Uh, but it's been a lot of work and it would just simply would not be possible without the support from all these kind folks here. And of course, the daily cast patrons. If you want to get involved, you can find a link to the Patreon in the comments below. Of course, a huge thank you for the NSG community team and for the SBL team for all the work they do, helping us set up to make content like this. And hopefully you're excited for the upcoming 24-9 ban list. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in a bit.